So the topic is where are we heading? Thank you. It's a, of course a oh, great pleasure to be back at NYU. I've been here <clears throat> many times before giving talks in this lecture hall, colloquium, and giving seminars. It's also nice to have so many familiar faces in the audience, people from various points in my career. And I have to apologize. I'm sure you'll be disappointed first because of the generous introduction. This talk will be neither deep nor clear. <laughs> and second, because I brought you here with false advertisement, uh, I ask the question, and they say usually when there is a question in the title, the answer is no. And well, of course, here it cannot be no, but the answer is that I don't know. I don't know where we are heading. So, what's the purpose of this talk? Uh, I'll give you a broad brush report of where particle physics is. And I'd like to think where, what would might lie ahead? What will we see in the, what will be the main themes in the near future? And in order to do that, we'll have to understand first where we are today, how we got here, what was the situation a few years ago, and what is it today, and see and compare the two. And I'll summarize the problems and the challenges that we face, and try to ask, where could we be heading? What are the different outcomes of various experiments? And in particular, I'll have a roadmap of what the LHC could tell us and how it could influence our research in the coming decades. So I want also to tell you what I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you new experimental information. This is not a typical physics colloquium. No new experimental information, no new theoretical ideas, no new theoretical computations. I'll present no new model and no new concept. Instead, I'll try to give an overview of where we are, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together and see what kind of picture could emerge. And then it will be interesting to see in retrospect, say five years from today or 10 years from today, looking back, say whether my outline for the future was correct with where we are on that roadmap that I presented. So first of all, now it's official. The Higgs is really there. It was even recognized by the ultra-conservative Nobel Committee. It was confirmed in 2013. These are Francois Anglais and Peter Higgs, who received the Nobel Prize for predicting the Higgs particle. And you can read the citation here. A pointer. You can read the citation here, there is no point in reading, and the short summary is yes, this is the Higgs. And indeed, the standard model with a weakly coupled, single weakly coupled Higgs boson works extremely well. It worked extremely well when it was first announced, and it was even better when the Nobel Prize was awarded. And even the last few days, there was New data was released with new information, giving more confirmation to the picture that the standard model with a single Higgs, the simplest possible model, works, and it works very well. So that's very good. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume, given this success, that the standard model description of nature is at least approximately correct. So let's take that as a given. We don't have to replace the S quark by something else. This is already settled with the Higgs. The whole package works. So this is what will be the, the working assumption. And we're very happy that very soon we'll know a lot more. We'll know a lot more because the LHC will resume operation within a year. And it will resume operation with much better characteristic, roughly twice the energy that it had in the first run and much higher luminosity, which will give it much higher reach. And we'll get a lot more detailed information about higher energies. This will give us more higher energy reach to see phenomena that could not be created, or particles that could not be created in, ran, in run one, and simultaneously will give us more accuracy on processes that were measured in run one. So if there's something which is not that heavy, what was not produced often enough, it will be produced more often and we'll be able to explore it. 
Now, there will also be data from other experiments, which we will not describe here today, but are clearly important part of the story. There are various precision measurements done in various other accelerators or in non-accelerators, labs. There are dark matter searches, dark matter, whatever it is. If it's a WIMP, for example, it could have applications to, or can have connection to electroweak symmetry breaking. And of course, there's a very interesting drama going on in cosmology between Planck and Bicep 2 and revisions of the picture. And in the future, there would be more data from Kekere and from other experiments. I'm not going to discuss any of these. But what is clear is that in a few years, we'll be a lot smarter than we are today. We'll have a whole flood of new experimental information from different directions. And I think it's up to us, the theories, to think how will all these things, how will all these things fit together? How will they come to a coherent picture? So the first question is what will the LHC find, specifically run two? This is a huge question we don't know the answer to. Of course we do not know, but we can try and anticipate. So I'm going to describe the various options that of what the LHC could find and try to give a somewhat oversimplified but kind of a picture of what the various options are, and I will organize it according to various different possibilities, according to different criteria. In every one of them, I'll have only two or three options, so it will be easy to remember. It'll be kind of slogans rather than a, a detailed picture. So what are the options? The first option is that the LHC will run and run two, will collect a lot more data, and will just confirm the standard model and nothing else. This, of course, will be Interesting because we'll know the standard model is right. In a way, it will be disappointing because one might think it does not give us clue, clues to the near future. But first of all, we'd like to know what it is. I'll later spend a lot of time talking about what it means if that's what the outcome is, the Higgs and nothing else. Then there could be various discrepancies with the standard model that can be discovered. For example, the Higgs production rate or Higgs decay rate to various particles might be different than what it is in the minimal standard model. This hasn't happened yet, and in fact, as time progresses and we have more and more data, especially the data, for example, the data from last week or so, we see that the error bar is just getting smaller and the agreement with the standard model is getting better, but we don't know what the future will show. Maybe there will be some discrepancy. There can also be small discrepancies in other processes. And more dramatically, there could be new additional particles. This will, of course, be the most interesting possibility, new particles beyond the standard model. And if that's the case, we need to extend the standard model. And we can put these various extensions of the standard model, we can organize them according to different criteria. So criteria number one is the added particles could be additional scalars, particle of spin zero. And theories have been discussing that, like called two Higgs, mod two Higgs doublet models. The Higgs sector could be larger than the minimal Higgs, and the first signal of that would be additional Higgs-like particles. They could be neutral or charged. There are various rumors that they exist. The signal is not, there's nothing to write home about so far, but in a few years, we'll know for sure. The second possibility, going up in spin, there could be additional fermions. And they could be just particles which are massive particles and vector-like representations of the standard model, like additional quarks and so forth. That's not too exciting, but it's no, good to know whether this is something in nature. We'd like to know what nature has in store for us. And going up in spins, there could be new forces, new gauge particles. And the name that people put with that is Z prime. Just as we have a Z boson, there could be another Z-like Z particle, which is heavier. And we can go up in spin and have spin three half particles. Now, that might, think, might seem kind of boring who cares if there is another particle with spin a half, another fermion, very unstable, lives for a tiny amount of time and then decays. But the reason this is interesting is that some of these developments can point to conceptual ideas, new ideas beyond the standard model, not just to say that there is a new force and, or a new matter particle, but there could be new ideas, and I'll outline some of them in the next slides. So the way these things will happen, they could, first there could be discrepancies with measurements of the production rates or decay rates uh, relative to the standard model. More dramatic, there could be a whole bump, a new particle that is discovered. And then comes the more theoretical, the more conceptual part, 
that this thing is really telling us something about the concepts in the standard model, or the concept of extending the standard model. And I think they fall, these extensions of the standard model, and you can hear, they, you often hear about a lot of them, they really four fall into two or perhaps three categories. So let me mention the three categories of conceptual extensions of the standard model. The first, which is my favorite one, is supersymmetry. And it is characterized by the, the, the fact that the additional particles that we add are weakly coupled. They are not, do not interact strongly with the particles in the standard model. The second option comes under the name of technicolor or warped extra dimensions or various other names. And they are all characterized by being strongly coupled. So just as we have QCDs, the theory of the strong interactions, there are other strong forces acting in the TV range. And the dynamics is complicated, strongly coupled, large fluctuations, and they affect the standard model. So this is the second thing that can happen, and it comes under different names, but they are all deeply the same. And the third category, which I think is the one that I think is most likely, is none of the above. Namely, something we haven't yet thought about. So there are literally tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 papers, give or take. That's the order of magnitude of papers analyzing these two possibilities and the various shades of them. And there's zero possibilities, zero papers on this one. And if, sorry? By definition. That's correct. <laughs> but it's still interesting that there are only three categories, and one of them we know nothing about. So that's why I said there are either two or three possibilities. And I met with the graduate students earlier today, and this was really fascinating. It's always fun to talk to young people. And they asked me, where is the next breakthrough? What should we be working on, and so forth? Wow, this is a huge question. <laughs> and the fact that old people like my generation couldn't come up with anything, you should view that as motivation. You're smarter, you're more energetic, you'll be able to do it. So these are the three categories, and I'll spend more and more time explaining, explaining them later, except the third one that I don't know anything about, but we should remember it. But first, I'd like to give a one-line summary. A one-line summary that will be easy to remember. One-line summary is always like that. It's easy to remember, but it's not 100% correct, because it is just, we have to compress everything to one line. So the one-line status report, and I put in parentheses many caveats, is that this measured mass of the Higgs, this 125 GeV, is an extremely interesting number, because it's uncomfortably high for minimal supersymmetry, and it's uncomfortably low for strong dynamics. So these were the two options I had before, supersymmetry being weakly coupled, weakly coupled option, or strong dynamics, by definition, strongly coupled. This number 125 is kind of right in the middle. Too heavy for one and too light for the other. And I'll give more details about that later, why this is a proper characterization of where we are. And, and that's really telling us something already. So the fact that we, we had basically two options, ignoring the one that we haven't thought about. So we had these two options. And this number 125 is kind of uncomfortable. I use the word uncomfortably high. It's not impossible, but it's getting really tight. For these two options, makes us wonder whether these two options are really the right one. So I'll give more details about that below. But let me start from the beginning. Instead of telling you where we go, let's really understand first what it is that we know, and then we'll, we'll be able to really get perspective on what the options for the future are. So the standard model, as we know it, is an extremely successful model. It works extremely well on a wide range of energies with literally trillions and trillions of experimental results. All work well. Many experimental tests and no known discrepancy between theory and experiment. I'll slightly qualify that later, but there's really no, no discrepancy. This is both good and bad. It's good because it knows that we know what we're doing. It's bad because we don't have a clue how to proceed. And the success is unprecedented. There are some processes that can be both calculated and measured to 10 significant digits. There isn't a single experiment in all of science which can be both calculated and measured with such spectacular accuracy. And 10 significant digits really tell us that we know what we are doing. It's not random. So this theory 
is a good theory, and it works. But of course, as physicists, we are much more interested not in the things we know, but in the things we do not know. Namely, the things, where are the problems in the standard model? So I try to make a list of them. And we'll start with more qualitative que questions, and then we'll move to slightly more quantitative one. So the standard model exhibits a spectrum of particles. Gauge particles, these are the three forces. Quarks and leptons, these are the matter particles. And repeated structure of generations. We have no idea where this thing comes from. And it does not look like somebody wake up in the morning and say, let's consider a theory based on the group this and that, and spectrum of particles with these quantum numbers. This is not the first thing you would write down. And the standard model exhibits that. So we would like to understand where this thing came from. The second, slightly more quantitative, but Ed will emphasize later, is also a qualitative question, is the question what determines the electroweak scale. And there are three masses in the story. They are all tied together. The mass of the Higgs, the mass of the W, and the mass of the Z. The W and the Z were measured in the early 80s. The mass of the Higgs, we had to wait till a few years ago. And what sets these, what sets these scales? And then what looks like, like more quantitative questions, most of the parameters in the standard model are known as Yukawa numbers, Yukawa couplings. They are numbers of, they are not dimensionless numbers. They lead to the fermion masses. The bulk of the parameters in the standard model are here. And they lead to fermion masses, mixing angles between the quarks, CP violation, and so forth. All of them are crucial to have physics as we know it. Without CP violation, physics will not be as we know it, and so forth. There are all sorts of parameters there. And we would like to understand where these numbers come from. So this looks like a quantitative question. But I would like to phrase this question as a more qualitative question. So. I'd like to talk about different hierarchies in scales in the problem. And the first scale is the scale of fermion masses. So the lightest of them, ignoring neutrinos, which in the standard model are exactly massless, the lightest of them is the electron. The heaviest of them is the top quark. From the standard model, from the point of view of writing a theory, they are all on equal footing. And yet, they spend five orders of magnitude. So there are five orders of magnitude between the mass of the electron and the mass of the top. And that strikes me as a qualitative question. It's not why is there a factor of five between them, but where did 10 to the fifth come from? So this is really a clear qualitative question. The second hierarchy is the pattern of angles, of mixing angles, between the different quarks. These are the CKM metrics elements. They are all small. They are all a fifth, a tenth, and so forth. Where did these numbers come from? Then there's another funny parameter, theta QCD. It's known as the strong CP problem. This is a number that's it's a phase. It could be any number between 0 and 2 pi. In the standard model, when this thing was measured experimentally. And it's less than 10 to the minus 11. And when I went to school, this was 9. And now it's pushed to 11. And the number keeps going down. And there are currently measurements trying to push it down. And who knows whether they will find a non-zero answer or not. This is a number that has no reason to be small. And later, I will really quantify what I mean by a number that has no reason to be small. But let's check it as it is, just even without looking too deeply. If we have a number that is experimentally 10 to the minus 11, less than 10 to the minus 11, it really begs the question, why? Why is it so small? I mean, if it were exactly 0, then I guess one would have to have an explanation. One would have to have an explanation either way. And I will really have more slides that, than you bargained for to address the question of whether something is small or zero, and whether, something, whether the question becomes easier when it's zero or not. And I'll have a lot to say about this particular question. Before I answer this question, I really want to encourage you to ask questions in the middle. I'm very happy when there are questions in the middle. Yes? Uh, I, <clears throat> I actually don't know what that is. Uh, so what happens if it's zero? Nothing. Zero is not a special point. That's the problem. But what, in terms of familiar physics, it is the strong CP problem? It's the, some dipole moment of the neutron, for example. Oh. So it's a, it's a physical quantity that we measure in the standard the model. That there's no dipole. That's correct. And it, and it can be calculated. In, it can be calculated. I forget the exact. Within the standard model, the known CP, it violates CP. That's why it's called the strong CP problem. 
So if we set it to be exactly zero and we calculate it in the standard model, it's some ridiculously small number. It's 10 to the minus 20. I don't remember the exact number. Much smaller than that. And then there's an additional contribution from the strong force, which depends on the parameter in the Lagrangian. And the parameter in the Lagrangian, for no good reason, turns out to be very close to zero. And I will say that in a language that is closer to your field in a few slides. So this really begs um, a question. This is begs to have an answer. Then there's the question of dark matter. And so, can you say these five, one, two, three, four hierarchies, they refer to both of the previous, the electroweak scale and the um, strong the force. Yeah, it's the whole package. The whole package together and has. They all they all mixed together, and if you, the question is, if you take just one of them but not the other, the question has a different flavor. But I view here the whole standard model as a package deal. We got the package deal. We celebrate the fact that it's true, that it works, and okay, now it has some numbers. We would like to understand these numbers. Where did these numbers come from? And I emphasize here that the numbers, the parameters in the standard model exhibit a pattern, and the pattern is not that the numbers are 1, 2, 3, but the numbers are 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the fifth, 1. So the num these dimensionless numbers are all over the map, and that's at the very superficial level really cries for an explanation. And then I'll make this question of cries for an explanation, I'll make it more precise soon. So then there is the question of dark matter. We know there is dark matter. Searches for dark matter so far have all turned negative. The windows are getting closer. Who knows what they will find? And the people in the audience who know much more than I do about it, but I think it qualifies to be a question. What is dark matter? How does it fit in this picture? And then there are neutrino masses, and that's really interesting because first of all, it's outside the standard model, and the standard model neutrinos are massless, but they reflect physics at much, much higher energy, so we can postpone it. But I would like to take one lesson from the neutrinos. Regardless of where they come from, they have mixing angles, not unlike the mixing angles of the quarks. But the pattern they exhibit is qualitatively different. The mixing angles of the quarks are small numbers, a fifth, a tenth, and so forth. The mixing angles of the neutrinos are all order one. So if you would think that, okay, we have some particles and they tend to mix and the mixing is small, we don't understand why, but one thing to remember, different particles have small mixing and other particles have big mixing, really highlighting the fact that we have no idea where these numbers come from. Uh, what do you mean by mixing angles? So they, they are mass eigenstates. There are different things you can diagonalize, but you cannot do that in the same basis. So you pick a basis where you diagonalize the masses, so every particle has a well-defined mass that you can look at the table what it means, but then the way it interacts is through linear combinations of the mass eigenstates. So the particles mix, and yeah, that's, a, that, that's what I said, not what I mean by that, that's what Kabibo and uh, other people long before my time uh, defined. So I'd like to give a historical perspective on all these questions. And the time scale I picked is 35 years, because it's a round number, and it's more or less the time when I learned about the standard bottle when I was a graduate student. So it's good for me also to look back at my history of 35 years. This is history I went through, and I feel qualified to comment on it. So this is kind of a personal perspective, but it's also a good perspective because 35 years ago, the standard model was already theoretically all in place. When I went to school, there was no alternative. This phrase, the standard model, was there. Everything about it was known conceptually. Maybe the parameters were not known, but the theory was known. And every single one, or almost every single one of the problems I presented so far were known in the late 70s. If you look at reviews from the late 70s, all these questions were mentioned there. And despite a lot of work over these decades, three and a half decades, I think it's fair to say that we still don't have a clue about any of these questions. So on one hand, we have a spectacular success with this model, that everything works great. On the other hand, we have questions. All of them were formulated 35 years ago. 
And we still more or less where we were 35 years ago, we have no idea what the answers are. And clearly the best chance to make progress is to probe physics at shorter distances, in particular at the LHC. It has been working extremely well and we are eagerly looking for results from the LHC. Yes. That's correct. I gave a list of the way I see the problems. This list was known in the late 70s. And none of them, and none of them has not been so. I don't think we made any progress on them. Well, a lot of stuff though. I'm going to wait. Glennis, 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 you will have about this other stuff. <laughs> That's the next slide. That's the next slide. Next slide. Well, can you wait with your question till the next slide and then. Yeah, I first want to present the gloomy point of view so that I can later make the more cheerful point of view with more force. <laughs> and indeed, it's not true that we haven't made any progress in the last 35 years. <laughs> we made progress both on the experimental fact front and the theoretical front. So it's not that all the DOE and NSF money was wasted. In fact, it was put to good use. Let me start with the experimental front. <coughs> 35 years ago, so this is the perspective I took, the standard model was in place, but we didn't know all the parameters. So 35 years ago, we did not know for sure that the W boson and the Z bosons exist, and they have the correct masses. This was known only in the early 80s, and I took as my timestamp late 70s. We knew that there's something like that should exist. It was even a Nobel Prize for the electroweak theory. But the experimental confirmation came in the early 80s. I mentioned all these parameters, like the masses of quarks and mixing angles. Many of them were not known numerically in the late 70s, and during the last 35 years, they were measured. And most recently, the Higgs mass. The fact that everything fits together in the framework that was already in place in the late 70s should not diminish the success of really confirming the qualitative picture and nailing down all these parameters and everything working together with these parameters that were measured. So that's the first experimental success that all these parameters of the standard model are now known. Second, I've already mentioned Higgs neutrino masses. In the late 70s, it was a speculation that they are not zero. There were reasons to believe. Some people believed in them, others did not, that they are not zero. For example, solar neutrino problem. But now we know what they are. They were measured beyond any doubt they are there. An enormous progress on the cosmology front, dark matter, dark energy, inflation. You cannot even compare what we knew experimentally 35 years ago and what we know today in cosmology. So this is a one, one slide summary of the experimental progress. Does this address your concern, Glennis? But it does not. It does not because we also made progress on the theoretical front. And you didn't complain about that. So on the theoretical front, We've also made enormous progress, and I, again, I remember things 35 years ago. It's a totally different field now. What did we learn? Start from cosmology. We have a whole picture of cosmology, the same standard model. 35 years ago, the standard model of particle physics was in place, but the standard model of cosmology was not in place. Now we have a clear picture, theoretical and experimental, and it all works. We've also learned a lot about quantum field theory as a theoretical structure. We have quantum field theory as a theoretical structure which underlies particle physics and condensed matter physics. And we understand it much better. We understand what its phases could be. We understand much better how to think about its dynamics and so forth. And we made enormous progress in understanding quantum gravity, mostly through string theory. And we've learned a lot of surprising things about this theoretical structure. For me, the most surprising thing here is the powerful connections between all these distinct fields. Quantum field theory describes particle physics, and it also describes condensed matter physics. And there has been, during these last 35 years, a lot of cross-fertilization between these two fields. Concepts from particle physicists found use in condensed matter physics, and vice versa. 
a lot of connections between quantum field theory and string theory. A lot of connections between quantum field theory, string theory, and other branches of physics, and most surprising, even other branches of mathematics. And this, for me, is a clear sign that there's something very deep going on historically when there was a development in mathematics that influenced physics, or a development in physics that influenced mathematics. This was a clear sign that something very deep is going on. And it placed an example is calculus was invented for physics, had enormous consequences in mathematics and in other branches of science. And it kind of feels like the unity of science. Many different branches use the same language and fertilize each other. This is clearly a sign that we are on the right path. So this is one slide for the funding agencies that, no, we have not been wasting your money. We have made a lot of progress in these 35 years. So now I'm going to focus on all these hierarchy problems that I mentioned before. And I'm now going to address some of these questions that were raised before. What do I really mean by a number being small? What do I really mean by a number being zero? And is there a difference between the two? And one point I would like you to take away from that is that this is something that occupied some of the greatest minds of 20th century physics. And I'll give example. This is not some esoteric idea that some physicist in the last five years thought about. This is something that has been around for about a century now. So I'll start with the various versions. So I'll gradually move through time. And I'll show a number of versions of this problem as it appeared over the years. So in its first version of the question, this is a question of dimensional analysis. Physics usually works with dimensional analysis. I always like to do the following experiment. I take this pointer, I throw it up, and I catch it. And you ask, how high does it go? So it depends on the time, how time will be. And on dimensional grounds, the only dimensional parameter in the story is the acceleration g. So the height should be g and some function of g and t. And on dimensional grounds, it has no choice by being g t squared. And then there's a number of order one, which happens to be a half, which really describes the height. And all of physics works this way. Dimensional analysis usually works. People use it in condensed matter physics, in astrophysics, in plasma. It works all over the place. And when it fails, it tells us there is something we don't understand. Whenever dimensional analysis fails, there is something we do not understand, something that explains the correct answer. And in this context, this question bothered Dirac very early on. Dirac knew about the mass of the Planck scale as being fundamental. Dirac knew about the mass of the proton. And they ask, call it the laws of large numbers, why is it that the proton is 19 orders of magnitude smaller than the Planck scale? So Dirac was bothered by this question. I'm, uh, he was a great man, and he was bothered by that, and we are justified to be bothered by the same question. Well, Dirac's question is now understood. We know the answer to Dirac's question. Dirac's question is really understood because of asymptotic freedom. Asymptotic freedom, and I'm not going to explain it here in detail, explains why the proton is so much lighter than the Planck scale. But there is a modern version of this question about why the W, the Z, and the Higgs masses are so much smaller than the Planck scale. And this is the modern incarnation of the problem. And more generally, we ask ourselves, why does dimensional analysis does not work? Why does dimensional analysis not work? In this case, dimensional analysis would say that there's a fundamental scale in physics, the Planck scale. So why aren't these three masses equal to the Planck scale? And this is a discrepancy of 17 orders of magnitude. Seven Where did it? Seven, one seven, one 17, seven. 17. The mass of the Z and the W and the Higgs is about 100 GeV. The, the Planck scale is 10 to the 19th. There is a discrepancy of 17 orders of magnitude. In fact, if you look at the numbers, you have to square it, so it's a discrepancy of 34 orders of magnitude. And you can give more weight to this question or less weight, but this is the same question that Dirac asked, essentially, and this is clearly something we don't understand. As we move through the 20th century, here is another person who was bothered by the same question. This is Mr. Weisskopf. And Mr. Weisskopf studied electrodynamics, and he said we should avoid quantum field theories which have quadratic divergences. Logarithmic divergences are OK. Quadratic divergences mean that things can vary very rapidly as I change the cutoff. So Weisskopf has this principle. It's in print in his papers. We should not study theories that have quadratic divergences. 
And as we move forward in the 20th century, this is Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson has his own version of this problem. And he said small scalar masses are unnatural. And he got a lot of his intuition from condensed matter and statistical mechanics. And Wilson said that a small mass for a scalar is like being very close to a phase transition. So we're in the, in the lab and we change the knob and at some point there is a phase second order phase transition. The mass of the Higgs is how close we are to the second order phase transition point. And the natural scale in the problem is the Planck scale. So here if you wish T minus Tc over Tc, which is the characteristic distance from the phase transition, is one part in 10 to the 34. That's very strange. Why did nature turn the knob so close to the phase transition point, but not quite? And these are really two questions, because even that being at the phase transition looks unnatural, but even more so, why is it a little bit different? As we progress in the 20th century, we're moving to Mr. Weinberg. Mr. Weinberg had another version of the same question. He said, as I described before Wilson's question in terms of turning the knob, Weinberg's question was, this is not a qu was statement was not, was that it was not a statement about quadratic divergences, but it was sensitivity to physics at high energy. So we have some physics at high energy, we measure something at low energy, and we would like the answer to be such that if we change the parameters at, low, at high energy slightly, the result at low energy does not change too dramatically. So it's sensitivity to the laws of nature at very high energy. And this enormous cancellation of one part in 10 to the 34 is enormously sensitive to what happens at high energy. So Mr. Weinberg was very concerned about that. And that was in the 70s. As we move on, move to Mr. Etuft. And Etuft tried to make it slightly more precise. And he said that a number can be small only when we have a new symmetry when it's exactly zero. And this way it connects to the question that the two of you asked me. So if we have a number that when it's zero, we have another symmetry, that's good. This point is a preferred point because we have another symmetry and we can declare that the symmetry is fundamental. And then being at, near that point is also okay because we are near the point that is symmetric. But we are near a point that no symmetry is gained, looks like a random point, that's not acceptable. This is a Tuft's statement. There's another way of saying the same thing. If you have numbers that are very close together for no good, sim well, for no good reason in the classical theory, you can imagine that somebody corrected everything and put everything to be right near where it should be. But in the quantum theory, things tend to fluctuate. So in, the quantum, in quantum mechanics, dimensional analysis actually works better than in classical physics, because the quantum fluctuations smear everything. So if you have some, one quantity that is very sensitive to another quantity, small changes here make big changes here, then the quantum fluctuations here will tend to restore dimensional analysis. Example, imagine we change parameters and we try two levels, we, change two, we have two levels and we change parameters in the system such that the two levels, le energy levels try to cross. Classically this can happen, quantum mechanically levels never cross, they repel each other. Except if there is a symmetry. If we gain a symmetry, the two levels can cross. So this is another way of understanding a Tuft's intuition. So these are really great men, they've done a lot of good work over the 20th century, and they were concerned by this question. So let me summarize that and try and put that in two categories. Category number one is that there are really two, so I'm claiming that there are really two distinct questions here. One of them is the intuitive question. We have a small number, we ask ourselves, why is it small? Where did the small numbers come from? We have to understand why. And we also have to understand why dimensional analysis does not work. Because as I said, dimensional analysis seems to work everywhere in physics, it does not work here. But if this had been the only question, we could have said, well, there's something, or in, we are doing physics at one TV, maybe the resolution will be a 10 to the 10th GeV, and then it's not an immediate question. So that's the intuitive question, where do the small numbers come from? And we can postpone this question. Maybe that's not an immediate question. Maybe it's not a burning question. 
But there's the more technical aspect of the question, which tells us that this is an urgent question to address. And this is the thing I said before, that even if in some approximation such a hierarchy was put in by hand, somebody arranged the parameters such that we have such a hierarchy, quantum fluctuations tend to restore dimensional analysis. And when this is the case, we really have to solve the problem at this very scale. We have no option of postponing the resolution till higher energies. So now I'm going to go through, in the next slides, through the various hierarchy problems that I mentioned before and put them in this description. Are they just the intuitive problem or is it the technical one? So I'll go through the problems with increasing degree of severity. I'm going to start with the fermion masses. Recall they span five orders of magnitude. Where did these numbers come from? Here we have only the intuitive problem. These are small numbers. We look at the numbers. It look very, looks very strange. The mass of the electron differs from the mass of the top by a factor of 100,000. We don't understand with a, where this factor of 100,000 comes from. There are many other small numbers in the problem. We don't know where they came from. But we can imagine that some physics at very high energy takes care of that. And that's it. So this is not a question that we really have to address today. This is a question that we can perhaps leave to the next generation. The second hierarchy problem I mentioned is this the strong CP problem that people asked me before to elaborate on. And that is this parameter theta. And I emphasize that there is nothing new, nothing special at the point theta equals zero. So theta equals zero is just some random point. And no new symmetry is gained there. And indeed, there are only logarithmic divergences, no quadratic divergences, but there is no reason for them to be small. And if the problem is the technical one, not just the intuitive one, this is something we have to address right now. And indeed, some explanations that people offer, there are axions, or maybe the mass of the up quark is zero, or maybe something else, are explanations that have to operate at low energies. Going up in severity, it's the mass of the Higgs and the electroweak. Here the problem really screams. Because here, when we tune the mass of the Higgs to be what it is, this 34 orders of magnitude discrepancy, we don't gain any symmetry by setting it to be exactly zero, and there are quadratic divergences. So here, all these questions that these luminaries of 20th century physicists complained about, starting from Dirac, through Weisskopf, Wilson, uh, Weinberg and at Hoft, all these problems scream here. They scream there is clearly something we do not understand. We have here both the intuitive and the technical problem. And therefore, this is a problem we have to solve now. This is a problem that has to be addressed at the energy scale where the problem arises. This is the way physics normally works, this is the way how quantum field theory works. And it doesn't seem to be the case in the standard model. But that's not the worst problem. The biggest hierarchy problem, this is the big elephant in the room, is the cosmological constant. And the cosmological constant is cortically divergent, even more divergent. And here the discrepancy is not 34 orders of magnitude, but 120 orders of magnitude. Here we have a discrepancy of one part in, and, in 10 to the 120. This is not something we can hide from. This is something that we really have to address. Where did this small number come from? And again, I emphasize, zero is not a special point. So we have something which is 10 to the minus 127. This is the worst failure, the biggest failure of dimensional analysis in all of physics. Now, going back to my 35-year perspective, 35 years ago, we thought that this number will end up being exactly zero and there will be some explanation why it is exactly zero. That was the hope, I remember that very vividly, and many people worked on it with no clear explanation of why it is exactly zero. But now it's a lot worse, it's very small, but not exactly zero. So there's clearly something huge that we're not understanding here. And that's not just that there's a number who cares what it is, this number is very special, and it's not what we understand. So maybe, just maybe, this whole idea of naturalness, this whole idea of dimensional analysis that reigned physics over centuries, which occupied greatest minds in the 20th century physics, maybe this whole thing was just misguided. 
Maybe this whole idea of naturalness, that numbers should be of order one, should have dimensional analysis, we should go for points with enhanced symmetry and so forth, maybe all this is just wrong, because there are clearly things where this logic fails. So let's examine the various options for natural solution for the Higgs mass, for this hierarchy in the electroweak scale. So the first option is known as technicolor, or more generally, strong dynamics. Some strongly coupled field theory, and in the TV range, people call it technicolor because it's a lot like color of the strong force. Maybe it's there, and maybe it puts things together. <coughs> Unfortunately, technicolor is basically dead. And if you never learned about technicolor, don't bother to learn it now because it's already basically dead. And intuitively, so the, it first was dead several years ago with precision measurements in the standard model. Precision measurements so, showed that the parameters called S and T, and these precision measurements showed excluded technicolor. But the mass of the Higgs that was finally measured also makes it, also excludes it. And intuitively, it's quite clear. Because we, all the dynamics of electroweak symmetry breaking is happening because of some strong dynamics. The Higgs should couple strongly to itself and to other particles. But the from knowing the mass of the Higgs, we know how strongly the Higgs interacts with itself. And since we know the mass, we know the coupling constant, and the coupling constant is very small. So that's not the sign of strong dynamics. Strong dynamics would tend to make the Higgs couple to itself stronger, and would tend to make, therefore would tend to make the Higgs heavier. Hence the statement I said before, the Higgs is uncomfortably low for, the mass of the Higgs is uncomfortably low for, for technicolor. Now, i put a legal disclaimer here. There are more sophisticated models for the Higgs using strong dynamics, but I think it's fair to say that they are extremely complicated and quite contrived, and we shouldn't take them too seriously. We're moving to the next option for natural solution for the electroweak symmetry, and that's supersymmetry. Unfortunately, it's harder and harder to make supersymmetry fully natural. And again, I'm just giving a broad, broad picture. The problem is that in the minimal supersymmetric standard model, this self-coupling of the Higgs, how strongly it interacts with itself, is tied together to the gauge coupling. And we know what the gauge coupling is. It's very small. So at tree level, the mass of the Higgs must be less than the mass of the Z. And we already know experimentally both sides. And this inequality is just not true. Radiative corrections could improve that and could lift the mass of the Higgs. But if you want to do that, you have to have, this is slightly more technical, with this, some particle called stop, the superpartner of the top has to be heavy, and some coupling constant in the Lagrangian called atoms have to be large, and we should go beyond the minimal model. Every one of these possibilities is logically possible, but it's very, very difficult to make all of them work. So as I say here, every one of these possibilities is problematic. Sorry. So we're looking at the standard model, and at three level I mean classical physics. At the level of classical physics, that's the mass of the Higgs. Quantum mechanically, so that's already ruled out. But we're doing quantum mechanics, not classical physics. The mass of the Higgs can be lifted in the quantum theory, depending on what other parameters are. And, but 125 is a little bit too high. It's hard to lift it by so much. Hence the statement I made, the mass of the Higgs is uncomfortably high for supersymmetry. It's uncomfortably small for technical and uncomfortably high. It's kind of right in the middle. Had it been lower, we'd say, wait, it's supersymmetry can do that. Heavier, we'd say, oh, clearly strong dynamics, technical, and so forth. Right in the middle, it's not excluded, but very uncomfortable. And in the next run, we'll be able to just not remove the word uncomfortably and replace it by excluded. Or discovered, depending on what happens. So what are the op there was a question here? None. So what are the options for about naturalness? I would like to put things again in a flow chart that is easy to remember. Option one, naturalness is correct. This idea that prevailed over the 20th century, especially in the last few decades, is a correct idea. And this could arise experimentally either by finding some version of natural supersymmetry. This is still not excluded, uncomfortable, but still not excluded. Option two. Maybe some other natural solution uh, 
of the hierarchy problem is found. Maybe it's not supersymmetry, maybe it's something else that we haven't thought about that will solve this whole problem of the hierarchy and naturalness. And hopefully this will happen soon. And indeed, once the energy of the LHC is raised, we'll explore this range. As I emphasized before, everything should happen in nearby energies. So this is something that will be explored very soon, and then we'll know whether naturalness is correct or not. It's something we'll know within a few years. Second option is that it's unnatural. And this could happen in several different ways. First, the LHC explores and explores and finds the Higgs and nothing else. This is a logical possibility. This could happen. <coughs> Sorry. Second possibility, there could be various unnatural versions of supersymmetry coming under the name of split. And finally, there could be all sorts of other particles that will be discovered. That will be very interesting, but they have nothing to do with supersymmetry or any other natural solution of the hierarchy problem. So I really see here a bifurcation, conceptual bifurcation, that depending on what the LHC finds, either nature is natural or unnatural. Either all these ideas of naturalness that prevailed over 20th century physics are correct or wrong, and this is something we'll know within a few years. So if it is unnatural, if the second option materializes, we'll really have to re-examine a lot of the notions of naturalness that we were thinking about. So I'd like to have a flow chart that describes that. So what are the options? Option one, is there something beyond the Higgs? So they turn on the machine, they find, is there something beyond the Higgs or not in run two? If the answer is no, we just abandon naturalness, as I said. If it's the Higgs and nothing else, that's what we do. If we find something beyond the Higgs, there is a question of whether this makes electroweak symmetry breaking natural or not. Does it or does it not explain the scale or the, the fact that the mass of the W and the Z and the Higgs bosons are so small? And again, there are two options. If the answer is no, abandon naturalness. And if the answer is yes, the world is natural. Now, which of these will be right? We don't know, but again, I emphasize this is something we'll know within a few years. Within a few years, you will hear about something at the LHC and we'll start using this flow chart and we'll know whether we end up here or here. So what if TV physics is unnatural? And the leading option, if these ideas of naturalness is wrong, the leading option that has been mentioned is that there is a landscape of vacua and we just happen to live in one vacuum in which the parameters are what they are. These ideas have been advocated by both particle physicists, string theorists, and some major cosmologists. People from all camps, some of them like this idea, some of them hate them. Even the students, when I met with them uh, this afternoon, this was the first question I was asked. What is your prejudice about this question? Are we going to have entropic reasoning or not? And I promised them it would be on the slides. And they were very skeptical, the students. I don't know if some of them are here to testify that they were skeptical. So the main idea here is that the world is much bigger than we think. There's a whole multiverse. And the laws of physics are different in different places in the multiverse. And the parameters are not natural because in one place these are the parameters, somewhere else the parameters are different. And we just happen to live in this universe where the parameters are like this. So predicting these parameters is a lot like predicting these parameters, like the electron mass, is a lot like predicting the, orbit, the sizes of the orbits of the planets. The sizes of the orbits of the planets are what they are, and nobody thinks these are fundamental numbers that have to be explained. Maybe the mass of the electron and the mass of the mu are equally not fundamental, and in our universe these are the values, in another universe the values are different. Just as in our solar system, the radii of the planets are these, and in another solar system, the radii of the planets are different, and nobody is too concerned about that. This is actually an interesting historical story that I think, I, I love this story because there are many interesting lessons from that. So Kepler is known about the, for his laws of the motion of the planets, but if you read Kepler's stuff, the law he was really most proud of is the following. Kepler knew of about five planets, and he had a model to explain the, five, the six planets, and he had a model describing the six planets that he knew about in terms of five platonic solids. So the planets move on spheres, thought they were circles, 
And these are the five platonic solids that are inscribed inside this sphere and they inscribe the other sphere. And he arranged somehow the five platonic solids and he wanted to predict the motion of the planets. And he was very proud of this because this has all the hallmark of great science. This is deep mathematics, the fact that there are five and only five platonic solids and all the ratios between their sizes and so forth. And not only is it deep mathematics, it also have, has heavenly implications about the motion of the planets. So this is a great story. This is a great theory. Unfortunately, it's completely wrong. And it's completely wrong. Already Kirkland used that. First of all, the numbers don't quite fit. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the planets do not move in circles, but they move on, on ellipses. So that's already kind of second reason to be concerned about that. And the real kicker is that there are more than six planets. And there are only five platonic solids. And now we know that this was a good question to think about, predicting the orbits of the planets. But now we know that this is the wrong question. Kepler, at his time, did not know that this is the wrong question. He thought this is a deep question. This is some heavenly objects that we try to, to understand. Just as we think today, it's very important to understand the mass of the electron and the mass of the mu and the mass of the tau. Maybe this is the wrong question. So it's good to keep this historical example in mind, but if indeed TV physics is unnatural, and this whole idea of naturalness was just misguided, then there are various things we will have to come to terms with. Should we really solve all naturalness problems? I mentioned the list of them, the strong CP problem, origin of fermion masses, these mixing angles, the mass, and not just the mass of the Higgs. Maybe all these parameters we're talking about are all environmental. And then we ask ourselves, should we or should we not try to solve these problems? More generally, if we are in such a, situ <coughs> in such a situation where everything could end up being environmental, how do we think about physics? What is it that we should explain and what is it that we shouldn't explain? There are all these numbers. It's not clear a priori. And some might look for This, in a way, is against the spirit of physics of the last few centuries. In the last few centuries, we always have been looking, we, mankind, have been looking for deeper and deeper truths at shorter distances. Chemistry was explained by the structure of the atom. The structure of the atom is explained by the nucleus. The nucleus is explained by the strong force. So as we go to shorter and shorter distances, we find a deeper and deeper theory that in turn explains the physics at longer distances. If this whole idea of unnatural physics because of a landscape, because of entropic reasoning, is true, it means that in a way we reach the end of the road. As we go to shorter and shorter distances, we will not find the deeper explanation that explains that. This will be the end of a road, theoretically, of physics starting from the days of Newton or maybe even from the days of the Greek. We've constantly gone deeper and deeper into matter and tried to understand things in terms of more fundamental laws at shorter distances, and it comes under the name of reductionism. So physicists always loved reductionism. We go to shorter distances and get the deeper explanation. Biology is explained using the biochemistry of the molecule. The brain will be understood by the connections of the synapses and the neurons. And the, the laws there will eventually be understood as a result of everything is understood in terms of quantum mechanics and itself is understood as a result of things at shorter and shorter distances. This is what physicists and chemists have been doing for centuries. Is this the end of this endeavor? Are we at the end and now we say, stop. From this moment on, everything is environmental. If that's the case, we are really facing a very strange coincidence in this set of affairs. First of all, as I said, if this is the case, we are approaching the end of the road, theoretically. Because these parameters have to be, whatever we don't understand, we blame on entropic reasoning. And we, if we think this is the right explanation, then this is the end of the road. Theoretically, there is no way to pursue physics at shorter distances. There is no reason to pursue it, because we already know that whatever we will find, will have an explanation uh, using this entropic reasoning. We also seem to be approaching a technological barrier, which is a barrier for totally different reasons. Now, it's, this is not a sharp barrier, 
and we could still gain another order of magnitude, maybe two more orders of magnitude, if we are lucky, maybe three orders of magnitude more in energy with accelerators or maybe with other techniques, but it's hard to imagine four or five more orders of magnitude in accelerators. It's hard to put it on Earth, it's hard to, come to get the resources and so forth. This is again a boundary, but this is a boundary of a totally different nature. It has to do with the, the resources on Earth and so forth. It has nothing to do with fundamental physics. It's very strange that these two boundaries happen at the same point. This is really a strange coincidence that the technological barrier and the theoretical barrier probe, these two probes the pro of probing physics at shorter and shorter distances really kick in at the sa same time. And of course, that the fact that it's now. This is very reminiscent of similar coincidence problems in cosmology and in other places. So personally, people ask me, the students asked me before, do you believe in that? If you asked me 10 years ago, I would have said, this is insane. There's no way this could be right. This is like declaring defeat. Because of all these reasons I said today, I am less sure that this is insane. I would still personally would hope it would go away and there would be some kind of a natural explanation. But we have to face reality. And maybe that's what nature is. So I presented these two options and I tried to make the case for, any, for these two options strong so that you see why these are reasonable things to expect. And what I think is exciting is that we're approaching a point where we'll be able to know. So we'll not speculate one way or another. We know for sure where the TV range physics is or is not natural. So in conclusion, if you fell asleep, that's the time to wake up. What can the LHC find? Option number one, no discrepancy with the minimal standard model. This is what we have seen so far in run one. And there will be run two, and then there will be run three. And that could be the outcome. This is option one. Option two, we find some new physics be beyond the minimal standard model, but such that it does not address the stability of the weak scale or this hierarchy problem. Could be some, another fermion, maybe another scalar, but this question of the hierarchy is not being addressed. This would be very interesting to know if it's right or wrong, but as far as the hierarchy, it's as good or as bad as the first option. Alternatively, there could be a natural explanation for the weak scale, either supersymmetry or strong dynamics or something else. Maybe some of the reasoning beyond, maybe some of the reasoning I presented here is incomplete. Maybe there is a loophole that allows us to make supersymmetry natural or strong dynamics natural, or maybe there's another idea that we haven't thought about. I would really like to emphasize that all of these options are interesting. It's not that one of them is a disappointment and another is not. First of all, they give us collect, correct, reliable information about nature, and this is something we would like to know. Is it this or that? Is there another particle there or not? Is it related to dark matter or not? Is it related to electroweak symmetry breaking or not? Is it natural or not? But what's more interesting is that they point to a very, very deep and very interesting principle about, with far-reaching philosophical consequences about, about, about the nature. Is our nature natural, so to speak? Is our world natural? Is our world special? Do we live in a special world where all these numbers mean something? Or do we just live in some random world where the mass of the electron is what it is and the mass of the top is what it is? And in some other world, the masses are different and yet in another world, maybe something else is different and so forth. Another way of saying it is not just is, the world, is our world natural, but it's the question of is this the end of reductionism? This has been going on for centuries. We've gone to shorter and shorter distances, learning deeper and deeper truth. Have we reached the end of the road or not? Is there new physics there that explains all these parameters or not? So I think we are in a win-win situation. Every outcome is interesting. And we are all eager to know what the right answers are. And this will ha happen really very soon, within a few years. So I think the future is guaranteed to be exciting. Thank you. Right. 
So I think the example you mentioned is the more intuitive aspect of the problem, the more qualitative aspect of the problem. There's a small number, we don't know what it is, it's a factor of 200. Where does this number of 200 come from? And indeed it goes back there. I tried to focus on the more technical aspect of the problem, that I think in this incarnation, it really starts with Weisskopf, who was the first to talk about quadratic divergences, and then through Wilson, a Weinberg, a Tuft, which give the more modern version of it. But you're completely right that this question has been around in various, well, in one form it started with Dirac, and then there was a question of the muon with famous Rabbi's question about the muon, who, who ordered that, and then there are all these other numbers that came which look completely random. And yeah, this problem has been around, I think it's fair to say, for a century, and it's very exciting that within a few years we'll know one way or another. This is really you know, something that has been around for a century, and now we'll know. That's exciting. Uh, Patrick was first and Alberto, then Pierre, and then um, So we had this flowchart where in an optimistic scenario it would go to yes, naturalness is still something that uh, we should use to guide us in physics. But here we just talked kind of about electroweak symmetry breaking the We didn't talk about that elephant that was in the boardroom. So even if we do see that the Higgs is natural, um, is if we don't find any sort of reason why the cosmological constant is so small, should we still throw out reductionism? Well, excellent question. And my view is that if we see the Higgs, I'll give you two answers. One is the more pragmatic and the other is the more philosophical. If the LHC finds a, a natural explanation, something that points to a natural explanation of the mass of the Higgs, I think a lot of people will be working on that. The fact that there's another problem that is very hard and we don't understand, so forget it for the moment. We have something concrete to work on, that's what people do. This is the pragmatic thing. The more conceptual question is still there. Well, there's the other problem, why do you care about this one? And there, what argument that people have been saying over the years is that the cosmological constant has something to do with gravity, maybe there's something in gravity we don't understand, maybe this is some physics at very high energies, this is something we can postpone because this is a question that could have been asked and was asked long before, and now we ask it again, we haven't made any progress, but here is a direction we can make progress, and maybe one day we'll solve the other problem, but we'll certainly have to face uh, this question. So that's in the mo most optimistic sense. I don't know which one is more optimistic. It's in one of these scenarios. I, I don't want to take a, I want to give value judgment about which one is better or, or worse. Because it's not up to us to decide what's good and for what's bad. We're doing physics, it's a we're studying nature. And nature will tell us what's right and what's wrong, not what's good and what's bad. So there's this scenario and that scenario, and I think we should keep an open mind. And, and then if, if the time comes and there's a natural explanation for electroweak symmetry breaking, I'll be delighted, I'll be working on that. And the fact that the cosmological constant is there, yep, we'll put it aside for a moment. Okay. I, I, I wanted to, to mention that uh, the, the Iraq tried to explain the ratio of the mass of the new one of the electron. He had a back model of the electron. Uh, and the new one was supposed to be an exact state. He calculated this, and I think he got the factor of 50 or something like that. And then he said, well, I didn't get the right number because I didn't have good speed. <laughs> so the lesson from that is even great men can have misguided. By environmental, you mean multiverse, the multiverse landscape. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Well, the message I got from you is uh, in the next few years, I mean, we'll, we'll know. But of course you had that third uh, uh, possibility, is that there's something we haven't thought of. And so I resist the implication that these are kind of definitive options. I, I know you didn't mean it, but that's the way you're sounding yet. Oh, we're going to abandon uh, uh, reductionism, we're going to close shop and all start doing the stuff that other people are doing. Of course you won't, because, yeah, well, you'll, you'll abandon this naturalness and you'll tr 
try to figure out some other naturalness. Let, let, let me give you an the example. Reductionism will be a little bit different. That's all along the. Of course, you you protected yourself against my objection because there's something that we haven't thought of. And by definition, that covers everything. But uh, there is there is this implication that I personally want to resist. Okay, I'm, I sympathize with your resistance, but le let me emphasize why I say that. When I said something we haven't thought about, I meant another mechanism operating at the TV scale. Now, it's hard to imagine that there's a, this is what I emphasized in the talk, that this kind of problem has to be solved now. It cannot be solved four or five orders of magnitude later. And let me give you an example from condensed matter physics. In condensed matter physics, there's a Lando Ginzburg description of BCS. It came before BCS. So BCS gives us the microscopic explanation of superconductivity. And the, before that, there was the Lando Ginzburg description of the same phenomenon. And Lando Ginzburg description of BCS, of superconductivity, is characterized by two length scale, the coherence length and the correlation length. And depending on which one is bigger, is whatever. There's a, sorry? Penetration length, yeah. So these are these two lengths. And these two lengths are very similar to the mass of the Higgs and the mass of the W. One of them is the mass of the photon and the, or the inverse of the mass of the photon, and the other is the inverse mass of the Higgs. So this analogy is, is quite good. But the lando ginzburg description is not the full story. It's kind of a caricature of the full story, but it's not the full story. Where does it break down? It breaks down at the length scales associated with that model. So as we are near the, the critical point, if we are near the critical point, these lengths are very, very long. Here, we are very close to the critical point in, in that sense. So the question is, where does the more microscopic physics kick, kick in? Where is it that the analog of the lando ginzburg in this analogy, the lando ginzburg description is the standard model, and BCS theory is the more complete theory that comes in. It's hard to imagine that lando ginzburg description differs from the more microscopic description by, say, three or four orders of magnitude. That's not the way it works. So that's why we have here the length, or the masses, are about 100 GeV. So you say, OK, something should come in and explain why we are so close to the critical point. And the something that comes in could be at 100 GeV. That would be the best. Maybe we can collect a few small numbers from here and there and be lucky at 1 TV, it's another order of magnitude. And maybe we can even postpone it till 5 TV. But at some point, we would just say, enough is enough. <laughs> if it does, this would really mean, what this thing would mean, is that we have a lando ginzburg description works to several orders of magnitude distances beyond its natural scale, and that's where BCS kicks in. That's not the way it works in condensed matter. And I don't see why this should work here. And if it does, it really means that there's something very fundamental we are not understanding. So that's, that's my answer to your question. But that's but, not the same as rejecting. Uh, well, I think it's very close. I think it's very close. Massimo, of course, the better is. Of course, you could have a mix of some natural parameters and some anthropic. After all, one of the, pro the, the leaders in both fields, the same person, like Weinberg, actually say, we may have to give up for the cosmological constant, have an anthropic explanation for that, but for nothing else. So uh, well, there are all sorts of midway solutions, but I, all I'm saying, all I'm saying, I, I agree with you completely. All I'm saying is that five years from today, let's give it five, maybe it will be ten, this conversation will look totally different. Will look totally different. It's already quite different than it was five years ago, because of the fact that LHC already first lap, and then the LHC in run one did not find anything beyond the Higgs. And it kind of excluded a lot of ideas that people had to a very large range. Now, in five or maybe 10 years, we'll push it another order of magnitude. If this naturalness idea is not revived within that order of magnitude, me, personally, I will give up on it. 
Now, you're welcome to say, no, naturalness is still a good idea and there would be something else we haven't thought about. Maybe. But as you keep pushing it, it feels less natural. In, in a non-technical sense. <laughs> but also in a more technical I'm sense. What you call that it's more, I think it's already uncomfortable. I think at the moment it's uncomfortable, but maybe we can get away with it. In five or ten years, I think it will be worse than uncomfortable. That's why I think it's so exciting. So I think a similar colloquium here, five or ten years from today, will be totally different. So Either, sorry? Five years from now, you're white. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, well, again, I spoke with the graduates and today, I think one of them will figure out what was going on. And they will give here the talk that will tell you one way or another what it means and how it all fits together. But it will not be, we'll not need a flow chart. If you find this, if you find that, because we know what will be found. So that will be a lot more solid and a lot more interesting. What is your opinion about the attempts to involve scale invariants to answer some of the questions you addressed? Well, you're not going to like it, but I don't like it. I don't like it because nature is not scale invariant. It's the Planck scale that... I know some people, some people propose ideas that there's a scale invariant theory up there in several hundred TeV. And they, if you look carefully enough, they do not really solve the problem of where, uh, they do not really solve the problem of uh, where this small number come from. You still put it in by hand and all the questions are still there. And in the end of the day, the fact that the Planck scale is there tells us that the, theory is, the fundamental theory is not scale invariant. So if it's not scale invariant, why should it become scale invariant at, at low energies? Spontaneous break. Unless there are other questions? Uh, no? Okay, uh, let's continue this conversation with people who are wine and cheese, everyone is in white. Thank you.